<laughs> Welcome to Shepherd Thinks Show today, and this time it's not just me thinking. I have an awesome guest on, a friend and deeper thinking philosopher. Um, so a little bit of the backstory for what this show is going to be about. Uh, my friends Christian and Patrick uh, came up with a moral philosophy a, a little while back, and you know the worst thing you can have in business or in philosophy is when you come up with an idea and you say to your friends, Hey, here, I, I have an idea. What do you think of it? Uh, punch holes in it for me. And then they say, oh, no, it looks good. It's like, well, that's that's not helping anything. <laughs> you want somebody who will really reach in and, and tear stuff apart. Well, I tried, and, and there were just a few little things that I, I had issues with. And then uh, Patrick and I did a show in which I challenged him on it. We went back and forth. I did a horrible job. I didn't, I didn't come across well. I didn't get any of my points across well. I think since then... I've kind of, in looking at things more, those have been resolved. And then Christian and I have spent many, many hours going back and forth um, on, on points. And I think most things have been resolved. So rather than bore all of you with all of this stuff, I figured we would approach things from a little bit different standpoint, as any proper argument should be. Someone makes an assertion, and then they back it up. And so uh, rather than me putting words in Christian's mouth, first of all, I'll welcome Christian. Christian, thanks for being on today. Hey, Shepard. It's great to be here. Uh, always fun to when we get a chance to chat, uh, whether or not it's on YouTube or just in uh, our Telegram chats or wherever we are. Uh, so thanks for having me. Well, thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, so kind of what we have, uh, what we've been going back and forth about is the anti-subjectivism uh, manifesto. And it's available, by the way, at antisubjectivism.com. You'll see uh, at the top of the screen, a button for manifesto. It's also available on odyssey.com, O-D-Y-S-E-E. -E. Uh, and Patrick reads it. It's about a half an hour. And it is a deep, dry, Philosophic. Your degree is in philosophy. Is that correct, Christian? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So Christian knows this stuff inside and out, and I am not a formally trained philosopher. I'm just a lay philosopher at best. Um, maybe I'm just more of a a bar over a beer occasional thinker. I, who, who knows? But I, there was something that I didn't like in the very beginning about anti-subjectivism. Was there was there was kind of this implied thing that, well, if we all want to have a good life and live together and be able to, you know, live as a society, as a polite society, then we have to, and I said, stop, that's subjective. Why would we want to do that? And I was taking the word anti-subjective to be a subjective without subjectivity. And so many of the hours that we've spent was just on that one little tiny bump. And I realized that it was my inappropriate understanding of language, there is a difference between being amoral and anti-moral, or apolitical and anti-political, or against subjectivism versus you ain't going to see none around here. Like there's a there's a difference in those things. So having first said that that was my first big error, um, what is anti-subjectivism? And does it replace Anarcho-capitalism, does it replace voluntarism? Are they a subset of it? Is it a subset of them? Like, what's going on with this? So um, just to start from the biggest scope, and then we can narrow ourselves in and make sure everything's super clear. Uh, Anti-subjectivism, the anti-subjectivist manifesto, the document that we're referring to, is a manifesto. You could also consider it a philosophical treatise, which is basically a document that is supposed to be an entirely self-contained and self-referential um, white paper, if you guys like crypto, maybe some of you guys are crypto, on um, what the mission statement is, what we're trying to accomplish, how we're trying to accomplish, and why. Most importantly, why we're trying to accomplish whatever it is. And just to kind of skip to the end to make sure it's clear, the biggest conclusion at the end of the day for anti-subjectivism is that we believe that we created a, an entirely self-contained and logically consistent justification for why consent is the primary um, mechanism behind all ethical interactions. Uh, and that's really huge. There have been a lot of people who we think in the past have, have made this claim and, and believed to have supported it as well. Very famous, influential people, Hoppe, Rothbard, Mises, all of these individuals have put a lot of thought into, into this same field. 
but um, Patrick and I have, have both and many others as well, have seen some of some issues with some of their foundations. And so we took a step back and started from bare bones, basics, what things do we absolutely need to have and not a thing more, and where do we get to from there? And what we arrived at was all ethical interactions must be consensual. Okay. And to me, when I think about what I want subjectively in life is I like the idea of people not doing things to me against my consent. And I am willing to say, hey, Christian, if you don't steal my dog, I won't steal your dog. Is that cool? And so (laughs) we both make this agreement that we're not going to be dog thieves. And then we think, well, let's spread it out a little bit more. Hey, Christian, if you don't punch me, I won't punch you. And so you guys kind of boiled down, boiled everything down to saying, well, both stealing dogs and punching people involves consent. If you want to give me your dog, then, which I would love, uh, that would be a consensual thing to have happen. Um, and so it wouldn't be a problem. So is that, am I kind of getting this right, that the 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 treatise, the, the manifesto is a, a formalization of this idea of don't start one, don't start none, won't be none kind of, kind of thing. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of that to it. Um, Anti-subjectivism's biggest departure from most of libertarian ethics is that we're not a natural rights theory of ethics, which a lot of, so, you know, if you've ever heard somebody say something like, it's my God-given right, that's the idea of like a natural right. I was born with this right. I have it. It ought to be maintained regardless. Um, we haven't really seen any evidence to suggest that those theories are are founded on that ground. So what we tried to do was try to um, make sense of the foundation that we do have, which is rights as agreements, um, or at least that we seem to have, just to check my language there a little bit. It's this idea of rights as agreements, um, which if you think about it mechanically, is uh, makes a lot of sense to where if you think about what it means to have a, a right to property, for example, there are a couple of things that come with that. I should have the right to do what I want to do with my property, to exclude others from my property, to defend it up to and including lethal force if the situation calls for it. Um, But what does that mean when we think about someone who is violating that right? So you'll hear a lot of people um, joke about the rights of the Constitution, and they'll say, what, is the paper going to fly out of the case and come and protect your right to free speech or your right to bear arms or any of these things. Uh, No, it it seems to be the case that when we say right, we're talking about essentially a social etiquette that says, hey, we all are going to agree that we can do these things. And if somebody decides to not care about that for whatever reason, well, at that point, we're not really talking about rights as much as we talk or talking about kind of like a wolf attacking you. You know, a wolf isn't considered or isn't isn't thinking like, oh, well, this person has the right to life. The same kind of thing is going on if someone's trying to murder you. They're not really they're not thinking like, oh, should I be doing this? They have a right to life. They've crossed that bridge a long time ago if they're in that situation. So that's where um, we introduce this element, kind of what you were talking about of like, hey, Shepard, let's uh, not take each other's things. You know, (laughs) and it kind of. It's taking that into and and codifying it into an an ethical text that can be expanded in any direction from there. Does that answer your question? Yes. And and so if so, I have used the analogy in the past uh, or or the word that it, it seems to me that you have said, okay, what if how can we come up with something that doesn't have any arbitrariness in it or any more than it has to have. So if you have a basic set of rules that are, let's not steal each other's stuff, let's not punch each other, and let's all wear blue dresses. Well, I don't like wearing blue dresses, so now you've lost me. And so how do we get rid of as many things as possible and have a foundation that I can be like, okay, I don't like that that person's wearing a blue dress, but I do like the fact that they're not punching me and this. So let's put the blue dress part aside. That's just lighthearted who cares in this um and is that that is essentially you're just trying to pick away everything that isn't absolutely necessary right so remember earlier how i was saying we're starting at the end with the consent part right so this is basically the first half of the anti-subjectivist manifesto is talking about 
subjectivity and arbitrariness and, and making what we call in the business a meta ethical claim about what ethical theories need to what standard they need to meet in order to be legitimately considered one or to be taken seriously as one would probably be a better way of putting it. Uh, and one of the claims that we make is that uh, if you're going to introduce arbitrary assertions into your ethical theories, you're necessarily opening the door for someone to just disagree with you on face value and say, hey, I don't care about people wearing blue dresses on Sundays or whatever it is. So now I don't have to care at all about your theory. It's not a, it's not even really a theory anymore. It, it becomes what, what I like to call uh, ethical wish making, where it's even if you have some good things in there that you just so happen to like, like, yeah, let's say we we will trade consensually. We will not take each other's things. Oh, but I would really like it if people wore blue dresses on Sunday. You've devalued and, and, in a sense, delegitimized all of the work you've done prior to that, which is where I think a lot of really good, prevalent, um, and influential philosophies that start with some pretty decent bases go awry, uh, where they try to include all these additional assertions on top of them. So yeah, it's it's something that we made very clear from the beginning of the manifesto is why it is named anti-subjectivism. Because if you're going to have an ethical theory with even the slightest bit of uh, persuasive power to it that can't just be dismissed on a matter of opinion, then you can't in include opinions in it. It has to be something that you can deduce from a set of axioms. Uh, and we can quibble and argue about the axioms. That's part of the fun of it. And that's why people will always disagree on everything. But I believe anti-subjectivism follows necessarily from the axioms that we've outlined. And if you can agree to those, then, it, then you don't have to have any opinions about anything. If you agree that certain facts of reality are the way they are, then you wind up with consent on the other end. And to me, that's a huge, powerful contribution to ethics. Okay. And so I, I interviewed someone recently who is not a into the world of philosophy. And as we were talking, they kind of came down to, to saying, well, I guess my worldview is that, that uh, it's none of my business. If it's somebody else is doing something, I'll take care of me. You take care of you. And, and that's, that's pretty much how I look at life. That person has never heard the term anti-subjectivism. They don't understand praxeology and meta blah, 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 blah the big words that you, you're so good at they don't understand what's under the hood of the car but they do understand they're not going to mess with me and i'm not going to mess with them and we're all going to be cool uh, is that person an anti-subjectivist are they part of the association or club or good guys group or whatever we want to call it what, what does it take to be an anti-subjectivist so really, you don't have to, I, I would highly encourage and recommend that everybody who's interested in this does the reading for themselves and learns why, you know, I think Patrick thinks and, and plenty of other people think uh, that this is important and cool and something that uh, you would like to be a part of. But technically speaking, if you wanted to call yourself an anti-subjectivist, all you would need to do is live out the rule that all ethical interactions, it means all things that you want to do and not be a bad person are consensual. And as long as you do that, you fit the criteria for an anti-subjectivist. So there's plenty of people today who consider themselves anarcho-capitalists or voluntarists or any of these other labels that are doing the right things. And 99.9% .9 of the time out of 100 will make the right decision based on the foundation that they've chosen. Um, the the big where the rubber meets the road is the 0.01%, right? We want it, it's a kind of our job as ethicists in order to help set up systems for people to where there is no 0.01%, to where if if we pull up with our ethical treatise or or manifesto and say, like, we've got the sauce, we want to make sure that we're not going to put people in situations where they might have an ethical failing based on doctrine. Um, that, that would be a horrible failing of the system, even if it's just 0.01%. So that's, that's another big reason why we've kind of gone the direction that we have. 
Okay, and that that makes good sense. I I've had a lot of uh, theists of the of the Christian variety say to me, and I'm an agnostic atheist. They say, well, that's really weird that you're an atheist because you're more of a Christian than a lot of the people who say they are, who I know. Well, it sounds like this is kind of a similar thing that, okay, you can call yourself an anti-subjectivist, but if we really get down to the nitty gritty, we open the hood, we see that one part, and then we unscrew that part and take it apart and get to the next one. And then we want to understand that that metal coil is comprised of a certain type of metallurgy. You have kind of provided that deep technical, but it's only what, 10, 11 pages document that says, this is the owner's manual for how to live an ethical, proper, moral life. Am I, I'm putting words in your mouth. Please correct my words. Yeah. So I would say that's probably the biggest distinction between honestly, a lot of libertarians, right? Like that libertarians are pretty known for having disagreements in their community, but really speaking, even, even libertarians that I, I wouldn't really want to associate with that, associate with that much. We're probably 90% similar. It's the 10% or the 5% or the 3% or the 2% or the 1%, whatever it is, that we're trying to come to agreement on. And I'll be honest, you know, I, I'm not going to pretend to be the guy who's going to like make everyone agree and we're all going to be 100% on board with everything. But I'd like to supply compelling arguments to get us closer there. And I think even if, you know, anti subjectivism doesn't become the new libertarian canon or something. Um, what I hoped is that it'll make enough of a stir for people to consider the foundations that they do have and why they have them, helping to move us closer to that, right? It's kind of like the idea, maybe you've heard Larkin or somebody talk about this, where, you know, society throughout history has kind of trendlined towards freedom. Whether or not, you know, we're, I wouldn't say we're in a place of freedom, but if you go back to, you know, feudal monarchies or the despotism of some of these ancient societies, it's pretty easy to look back and be like, you know, maybe maybe we're in a better place than we were back then. Um, and that's kind of the same thing. I view philosophy as a, as a human project. Um, I will not be the end of libertarian philosophy, certainly not, just as the people in the greats before me, not to say that I'm one of those people, just to make sure, but just <laughs> as the greats before us, we're, we're not the end of libertarian philosophy either. We're all building off of each other. And uh, the whole idea is that this is a contribution on that to help get us all closer on that trend line towards the rock solid foundation that we're all looking for, the ultimately justifiable social uh, and ethical philosophy. Okay, okay. And so so my I, what I've kind of come to realize chatting with you over the last weeks or month or whatever it's been that we've really been focusing on this is is that I don't think I, I I pack the gear to serve in your beloved core. I don't think I have um, the the knowledge completely a, a, a fault of my own. I, I haven't taken the time to study to understand uh, philosophy, the mechanics of it, and so I, I feel like I am trying to have a conversation about the wrong kind of wire in the alternator with a mechanic, and I don't know anything about alternators or wire or metallurgy. Um, and I'm trying to have that conversation with somebody who is experienced in that. So for the lay person like me, I think you, you said it right in the beginning, we can just chop off everything after that. Consent is, that's the foundation. Everything is consent. And if you don't think so, and you happen to be a mechanic, then here's the manual, here's the person to argue with. But if you're not a mechanic, then, hey, does that sound good to you? Right, right. Um, and I think I think that's a fair way of looking at it. Um, you know, like there are plenty of things in, in my life that if I have someone to come in and repair my AC and they say, hey, you need a new, I don't know, I, what, what are even AC parts? You need a new <laughs> blower or something. I'd be like, well, I, you know, I need a new blower. Cool. That's that's what you're here for to <laughs> diagnose that. Right. And I kind of have um, not not saying that people who don't want to go and look um, shouldn't, because that's what the manifesto is for. You know, if you want it, it's right there. All of our arguments and everything are there for you. But yeah, to a certain extent, I think as long as you hear the phrase, hey, every interaction I'm involved in must be consensual. And you're like, I, I think I'm cool with that. Um, really, you don't need to go much further than that. If, if that's something you're interested in and something you like, 
then awesome. Uh, now, <laughs> whether or not that understanding alone will make sure that you can do that is perhaps up for debate a little bit, but it'll get you 99.9% .9 of the way there, right? Okay. So then if I want to examine something, let's say that I was a, this is, an ex, this is just an example. It's a crazy edge case. Let's say that I was a voter and uh, in, in government ele elections. And I said to myself, self, is voting in line with anti-subjectivism? Then I could open up the book and say, is what I'm doing consensual? I'm walking into a building. I'm asking some pe other people to take money from everybody and to spend the money on things that I want them to and to tell other people what to do and what not to do. Oh, yeah, that violates consent. So maybe I shouldn't vote today. So it's almost like a, a resource a policy and procedure manual for making good decisions, it seems. Right. And, and it's a very simple one line rule, which uh, for a lot of people, you know, the non-aggression principle is popular for that very same reason. And I think a lot of people will see a lot of similarity between the non-aggression principle and um, the principle of consent that, that we have. And they are functionally very similar. But the reason that we don't have a non-aggression principle is because of the way that we came up to derive where we're at. Um, so the idea is basically what differences there are between a lot of conventional ideas that you would see in, in, in more standard libertarian thought are all uh, a product of how we reached our conclusion. And to understand why we did that, to some degree, you have to crack open the manifesto. And um, a lot of these are going to come from like our, our initial assumptions, or as we call them, or axioms, if you want to put it that way, from the preface of the document, which are things like um, the, the rules of reason are sound, uh, reality exists subjectively, and uh, the state of nature, the, uh, the existence of the world is, is an amoral state of nature. And you know, if you don't understand what those three things mean, that's no problem. I think we do a decent, maybe not an expert, but decent job of kind of explaining what we mean when we say that. But it'll be hard to uh, to evaluate those things. So that's also, I think, another part of um, the larger project of anti-subjectivism that we're going for is that we're really trying to open the door of moral philosophy to more people, not just in a sense of like knowing it and being able to recite it. Like you'll know a lot of people who can tell you exactly what Rothbard thought and maybe even why he thought it, but they won't be able to tell you um, what like counter arguments are or how to, what potential issues they have, because there's not that much of a critical perspective. Why would you? It's Rothbard, right? Um, so that's another thing that we're kind of hoping for, or at least I'm kind of hoping for as well, is to like help introduce people into this more critical perspective of all ethical theories, because a large part of anti-subjectivism isn't just calling out like, hey, we disagree with some libertarian ideas. It's calling out all of ethics. It's saying, hey, you guys are doing this thing that we don't think you should be doing if you're going to be taken seriously as an ethical theory. Okay. So... <laughs> There are a few things that some examples that I've given, some edge case scenarios, uh, you know, lifeboat, flagpole kind of libertarian drinking games. Um, actually, I just mentioned drinking, so now we're going to be struck on YouTube. But anyway, um, yeah, darn it. We're, people are, <laughs> nobody's going to miss this, hopefully. Hopefully everybody's watching this on Odyssey, O-D-Y-S-E-E.com. Way mm -hmm. better video uh, channel than, or way better video platform than uh, YouTube. But may, may I toss out a, a, a silly edge case scenario here and then kind of walk me through it in, a, uh, in an anti-subjectivist manner. My concern is that when, I, when I'm coming up with a system by which I'm going to do something, it needs to work for me. So if my system for measuring boards to build a doghouse is a, a scale, then it's just not a good way to measure boards and it's not working for me. So I'm going to use a tape measure instead. Mm -hmm. I want to live a good life, treating people well, being treated well, seeking my fortune, you know, do it. I just want to live a good life. And so I'm looking for systems that will help me do that. And it's not like I'm going to burn in hell. If I say, I don't want anti-subjectivism. I simply don't get to be part of that group, that, that group of people who are 
have a mutually reciprocal agreement with each other. Am I am I on board so far? Yep. Okay. So I, I came up with this scenario, and I don't like the the conclusion of it. What if I follow anti-subjectivism? I don't like what comes of it. Well, if I don't like something just arbitrarily and it doesn't sit right in my gut, then is that a good, consistent, repeatable scientific method for looking at things in life? Of course not. But here goes the scenario. I, I live out in ranch country and a lot of open land. The The neighbor next door, let's say, is a, out in his yard. He's got a quarter mile long driveway. And all of a sudden I see a, some stranger, some car comes screeching in. The, the person jumps out. They're right by his house. They pull this body out of the trunk and dump the guy uh, in the driveway. And the guy's kind of struggling to his feet as the car goes speeding away and is gone. The guy, the, the kidnapped victim struggles to his feet. You know, he's ripping the, the duct tape off of his mouth, throws it on the ground. And he's like looking around, where am I? And my neighbor comes out and says, get the hell off of my property. And the guy says, oh, yes, sir, will do. And he looks, he sees the driveway. And so he takes off running, limping as fast as he can to, 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 a group, to do what the property owner says. And the property owner waits about a, a quarter of a second and, and, and says, you know, that's not fast enough for me. Gets in his truck, comes up behind the guy, slams into him kills him and his body goes flying out and lands on the, uh, the, the common, the common ground. My understanding, my gut tells me my neighbor did a wrong thing. Uh, this guy, this kidnap victim didn't have any ill intent. This kidnap victim never took an action to violate anyone's property by trespassing or anything else. Just the opposite. At every moment of his life, he did everything that he could to, respect others' property. And yet when I put this to the anti-subjectivism test, the guy is trespassing. And if somebody's trespassing, there it's a black and white line. You get to use whatever means of force you want to remove them. And if you don't, if you do what I prefer and there's a continuum of force, only use that amount of force which is reasonable and necessary, which is the US government's, which isn't too bad of a thing, I think. Uh, that's adding arbitrariness. So I, I feel like anti-subjectivism wouldn't let me do that. Is that accurate? Yeah. So this concept of force symmetry or force proportionality is uh, really famous. Is really famous by Rothbard. You know, the one who coined the non-aggression principle is he's the guy who said you can you can violate someone's rights up to the extent that they violated yours. Uh, and that's his theory. And he's working from a, a natural rights foundation, like we talked about earlier. Um, however, this may come as a surprise as someone who doesn't really agree with his natural rights foundation. Um, I don't think he adequately justifies um, proportionality in his own system. So the guy who advocated for the NAP, including proportionality, I don't think made a sufficient enough argument. And I'll tell you why. From two perspectives. Once, because I know there's probably going to be plenty of people who have this Rothbardian conception out there. So I want to address that head on. What we have is, is we have someone who is unfortunately uh, aggressing against another person's property, right? So we have to understand the fact that it isn't their fault directly that they are aggressing against this person's property. Um, they are not, um, it was never their intention to aggress against this person's property, but much in the same way that, much in the same way that we would have uh, someone who accidentally rear ends you uh, is also aggressing against your property. It doesn't change the fact that an aggression was done. Now we're slightly complicating this scenario here by making this person a kidnapping victim and not somebody who just fell off of their bike, right? Uh, so at the end of the day, what's it, it would be as if uh, someone collided into you in your car and then your car hit their car. <laughs> mm -hmm. the, the way that this winds up or the way that this winds up working out is that you go backwards in the chain of events to find out who the original perpetrator was. And so the way I like to say it is who is the primary cause whose effects led to uh, the aggression being done? And so it would be, well, Let's say I'm the person who was hit. The person behind me hit me. So their effect, they are the cause of their effect. 
um, but their effect was caused by the person behind them. Now, we are still responsible for our body and properties. We are still responsible for how all of these things are maintained. Um, so another example, hopefully I'm not, let me know if I'm going too far afield, but no. um, another example that I've gotten pretty recently is, okay, what if someone rear ends you because their brake lines failed? That's not their fault. Well, that's your property. And you are responsible as the, you are the primary cause of whether or not your vehicle is reliable. Not, not your vehicle, not the weather, not you. You can always check your brake lines whenever you want. That's always up to you, right? Um, and so as awful as it sounds, and I understand that this can be as unpalatable, um, you should minimize circumstances in which you could be kidnapped. <laughs> okay. That sounds silly, right? But you should minimize circumstances in which you could be kidnapped. Um, if you are kidnapped and thrown into the driveway, the person can come out and ask you to leave reasonably up to and including force. Uh, if you were to try to remove yourself from the premises as quickly as humanly possible, then sorry, my brain, I'm, I'm thinking about this, like as I'm going through it and this was this the same scenario we used in the telegram because now I'm thinking, um, or was this the one you talked with Patrick about? This is the one I talked with Patrick about, I think. And, I, and I've and i kind of changed it some, changing it to a kidnapping victim just to add that thing that brings in the element yeah. of intent. I don't think um, I don't think a kidnapping victim, you'd be justified in shooting them. Now that I'm saying it out loud. Because the way that this works, okay, let's take a step back. <laughs> if you If you are the cause of your actions, intent doesn't matter right? You are the primary cause of your effects. So if I walk onto your property, I am the cause of the effect that is walking onto your property. I am fully liable for what happens, right? But let's say, let's change the scenario slightly. Um, I, I Actually, let's just do it this way. If self-defense, we'll make it a self-defense scenario. If I shoot someone in self-defense, I am the cause of that effect. I shot them, they died, right? Because they aggress upon me. That's the scenario. Um, if I shoot someone and someone behind them gets hit, right? That person who gets hit, that's not my responsibility. That's the person who initiated the regret, the aggression, because they are the cause of the situation where I produce the effects, right? They're the ultimate cause of all of these things. So that's what we have to look for. So in this scenario, the... There's two ways this could go, and I honestly am, uh, I don't want to give you the wrong answer here, but it's either that you do, you are allowed to, you are allowed to evict them from the property. That is true. You are allowed to evict them from the property. So it would be on, it would be on the person who kidnapped them, morally speaking. Now, this is a very complicated edge case scenario, um, and I don't recommend that anybody run anybody else over with their truck if they've find a kidnapping victim in their lawn. But it's the same kind of idea as to where an aggression has been occurred onto your property and you have a non-negotiable right to evict from your property. If someone walks into your property, you get, or, or parachutes in or gets blown off course or lands their, crash lands their plane, you have the right to evict them. Uh, it doesn't matter if they were thrown out of a helicopter you have the right to evict them. And so the, the person who would be quote unquote at fault for putting this person in that situation would be the person who kidnapped them. And that person should be uh, brought to restitution court, your DRO, whatever, or put on the bounty list, whatever, however you want to deal with it yeah. in your society. Um, but it's not the person who's trying to maintain the integrity of their rights fault that they were put into the position to where they had to evict that person to to do what they felt was necessary to maintain their their um, safety essentially because property is an extension of self ownership so it's it's better to think about property as an extension of yourself than it is to think of it as objects that you just so happen to call your own um, so I know we went in a roundabout way there I almost twisted myself into a knot a little bit but that's that's the justification for it is that you always hold 
the right to exclude somebody from your property. Doesn't matter if they're their own accident, doesn't matter if they're their own purpose. Now, how do we square this circle with the G Christian? That seems really harsh and bad. And the this is what is morally justifiable. So I'm going to, I don't usually go this route, but I feel like it might be useful just for a bit of perspective. And it may sound like I'm being a little preachy, but I promise this is with the best intentions because this is a transformation I've had to go through throughout my life. And that's, we are all, we are all essentially a reflection of the people and ideas around us, right? We absorb these things as we're growing up and we may develop some preferences of our own, but to a large portion, what we hold to believe in our, is, again, especially in our younger years as we're forming, which tend to concretize more than they do diverge as we get older, is a reflection of the ideas around us. And so to us, who have been born in this this democratic republic with institutions of law that are supposed to handle all these edge case scenarios for us. And, so, and we've been told since we were children, they make the rough edges round and we don't have to worry about any of that. That's all their job. Suddenly, when these situations get thrust upon us, it doesn't feel good because instead of the state having to make these choices and it just being the state's whim that's being done, we are the ones who have to make these choices and to justify them. We don't get to push it off and say, hey, this is somebody else's job to choose. It's ours. Um, and that is basically a really long way of saying, of course, people don't think it's kosher because they've been told their entire lives it's not kosher. Right. <laughs> of course, we have an icky, bad feeling about this thing because everything around you is telling you not to do that. Now, again, part of my social conditioning is telling me you shouldn't do that. Don't run people over with your truck if they're kidnapped onto your property. But I can't shoot you if you do. These are the this is these are the two positions that I am forced to hold, compelled by reason to hold. Um, and, and I don't necessarily like that, but there's plenty of things I don't like in the world. And I don't get to pick which what you know what I like and don't like. What I get to what I get to pick is whether or not I'm going to respect the rights that people do have. I think you and I agree that the scenario that I gave, if we could say something to this neighbor who ran over the kidnap victim, we would say that ain't right, man. Like I think we both agree that's uncool. I wouldn't want to associate with him, for sure. Yeah. How, however. What I have struggled with is I've thought about this scenario and, and several others, and I won't complicate it with them. But as I've thought this over is that, that just ain't right, man. And, and I would feel justified if I was watching with a third neighbor, I was watching this all happen next door. And the third neighbor grabbed a gun and shot my neighbor and says, you don't get to kill innocent people who have done nothing wrong. You've got to give them a reasonable amount of time to get off your property and I saw the neighbor shoot them, I'd be like, yeah, good job, man. You saved me from having to do that. Now, when I look at this from your perspective, I completely agree. I can't argue with that, especially if I'm trying to reduce um, subjectivity, arbitrariness, because I think it would be worth informing this, this group, this club, this society, whatever we want to call it. I think it would be worth adding a page or two of additional arbitrary rules, like if somebody drops off of a flagpole uh, or, or drops onto your flagpole from the balcony above, you need to let them safely go to safety. And so we're flipping the who we're talking about. We're not talking about the person who draw, who is hanging on, whether or not you have to let go. We're talking about the, the onus of the property owner to allow an accidental trespasser to make a speedy and reasonable exit. The problem then becomes, and I, I kind of did this on the one of the documents Patrick and I were going back and forth, you'd have to have a schedule. Well, if the person is under 25 in good athletic condition, they're allowed 13 seconds. If they are 25 to 35, they're allowed 17 seconds. If they're in a wheelchair, they can do this, but they can't leave the wheelchair on your property because that's littering. Like there would be so many arbitrary 
extra things that would have to be added. But I, I go back to, I don't want to live in a society where it is completely morally acceptable that it's just aesthetics if a completely innocent person has violence initiated against them, the, the guy in the truck. There's got to be that level of intent. How am I just being a a dreamy tie dye kind of thinker here with my energy crystals? Or, uh, well, you know, I I kind of liked where I was going earlier, so I'll, I'll I'll go back there again. Um, what if you lived next to somebody who um was a uh devout nondescript religion that required women wear head covering up to and including death right and they saw that uh you didn't have hair head coverings on the women in your life and said well that's just not right that's just not right or let's say um you (laughs) well this isn't a good example man There's a better example than this because that doesn't work because it has to be like you initiating what they would consider an aggression. Um, or maybe that's just it. Maybe they consider it a moral violation for whatever reason in their own personal canon. They consider it a moral violation for you to let your uh, the women in your life walk outside without a uh, headwear on. And so they decide, and then their neighbor next to them who agrees with them says like, well, we can't have these infidels around and just pops them, right? They have no justification, no rational moral justification for why they're doing what they're doing. But they feel very strongly that it was the right thing to do. Now, I disagree with them. I am very certain you disagree with them as well. But it's kind of a kindred reasoning. You're doing what you think is legitimately right, but you can't morally justify you can't justify it on the grounds of like a reason ration rational argument and that that's an issue right unless everything goes from shooting people not wearing proper headscarves to don't run over your neighbor or, or, or the person aggressing against your property rights or else i'll shoot you and then we're not doing moral philosophy anymore we're doing the state of nature with extra steps and i don't mean to uh, to say all of this to sound like I'm being disingenuous or delegitimizing any of this perspective that, that you might be having, but more so to say that um, it's really easy from where we're sitting to feel like uh, what we've got have, needs to be the way that things are. Um, you know, if that was the case, I never would have stopped being a Republican, right? If I was like, well, my way or the highway, I'd just be back over there in the in the constitutionalist Republican camp being like, yep, here we go, Constitution all day, every day with my little signs. Um, but at some point, I had to draw the line. And then you just have to ask where you're going to draw that line. Is it that things I would be really uncomfortable with my neighbor doing but aren't aggressions, things that are only aggressions, or are you going to draw the line way up here and say just anything I don't like whatsoever? is going to be things that I don't allow. That's another way of looking at it. Um, as far as why I feel comfortable enough to come onto a YouTube program and say things that would by most people be considered completely awful, you know, <laughs> because at the end of the day, I think that's the position that we're in. Hmm. Yeah. And, and it, the reason I'm having such a struggle with this is, is that most things that I think about in philosophy, when I break them down, when I open up the owner's manual, and it takes me a long time to study it and reread and reread and reread, but I finally go, oh, okay, that, that makes sense. And this one, and when I say sense, I should examine that word. That makes common sense. Well, what is common sense? That's an arbitrary term. It's subjective. But to me, it feels right. It it doesn't feel right. Um, I can see this in this neighbor's example, I can see the neighbor grabbing the guy by the hair and dragging him to the edge of the property and throwing him out. I'd be like, okay, that you suck, but okay. But just downright murdering the guy, initiating violence. And maybe I've just been thinking in the NAP so long that I think it's valid that maybe that's my bias. Um, 
maybe I shouldn't mind if people initiate violence against others, but it seems to me like that's a pretty good place to draw a line is gross bodily injury murder. Uh, but I, I completely get what you're saying too. Well, well, what about a little bit lighter punch? Well, what about a slap? Well, if I'm going to draw the line at murder, I, you're just as well, you have every right to draw it at a, a hard slap. Um, if, if we're being technical about it. Yeah. I, so to use a less grotesque example than I, I was, I, I had a conversation about purpor, forced proportionality not too long ago. Um, and one of the examples that I gave was like, uh, so, so basically they're saying you can, you can aggress against, or you can commit violence up to somebody or aggress against them up to the extent that they aggressed against you. Right. And so the idea is, um, let's say somebody uh, intentionally broke every bone in your body and you'll be crippled for the rest of your life and your life will be miserable and it'll be awful and it'll never go back to the way it was before. And the argument is, well, you could do everything up to break every bone in their body, cripple them, make their life miserable and unlivable hellscape, but you can't kill them. And the justification for that is, is that it is like the right to life is a separate right in to, in it in and of itself, but that's a snake that eats its own head in this case, not even its own tail, because all rights, most libertarians agree on this. Maybe some will disagree. Maybe like Christian libertarians might have a different perspective on this, but most libertarians agree fundamentally that all rights are property rights at the end of the day, and they're derived in some form or fashion from self ownership bodily autonomy. So I've always found it interesting that this idea of, of violating a sub right doesn't include uh, any of the other rights, because I don't see a way to where you can violate someone's self ownership without totally and completely violating their rights. Because I don't see a line anywhere that I look for it between you violated my property and you violated my life. Let's say my property is my well-being. I own a farm and you burn my farm down and I'm going to starve to death. I haven't starved to death yet. Can I kill you? No? Well, I'm going to die eventually because of this. Again, we can do these hypotheticals all day. But the point I'm getting at is, is that um, when you commit an aggression against somebody, you are completely rescinding yourself from the exchange. Even if you did so accidentally, even if it was not your plan or intention to do so. And that's part of our responsibility as people who are in the world and can act in it accidentally and unintentionally to make sure we don't do that. That's why um, that's one of the reasons why you carry your gun in a holster when you carry it and you don't just slip it in your pocket. Because that minimizes the chance that your keys are going to get up into the trigger and you're going to blow a hole in somebody's leg, right? Or that's why um, you actually do um, check your brakes every once in a while on your truck. Because if your brakes don't work and you slam into somebody, that's going to be your fault. Uh, and I think there's, there's a certain level of intuitiveness to this idea that gets obfuscated by legitimate efforts to be kind to people who have been put in unfortunate circumstances and traditional answers to these sorts of problems where we have legal systems that take into consideration intent uh, in, in ways that I don't think are tenable and never have been tenable. The idea that you can, you can uh, intent, um, this is another argument that I got in, so I figured it might be worth just saying a few more words on it. Yeah. Intent is something that I can reasonably say that because I am on this video call talking to you right now, that I intended to be on a video call talking to Shepard. But that is uh, the most boring, teaches us nothing idea of consent ever. But that's because actions, we can reasonably infer why someone did them, right? Or why the action was done in the first place. So if I get into a car and I'm driving, I can reasonably say I had the intent to get into a car and drive. But we cannot reasonably project out from that what people's intentions of the effects are. You can't say whether I came on here for certain 
uh, whether my intentions were to get Twitter famous and to blow up and make millions of dollars or whether my intention was to maliciously, you know, plot some scheme to take down Shepard's channel, or if I'm here with totally genuine intentions to teach people about a really cool philosophy called anti-subjectivism that I like. All you can know is the most boring thing that is self-evident to your eyes is that he intended to be on a call today with Shepard. So th th that's, um, that's, essentially as far as we can get with intention and that does make things um it does change the way that we have to engage with things because this idea of um like it would essentially erase the distinction between murder and manslaughter unless we come to agreements through like a dro a dispute resolution organization or an arbiter that says like okay we're going to classify this as this and this is that and we're all going to sign here and agree on that otherwise there probably wouldn't be such a thing as manslaughter because whoever is the cause of a person's death will be treated as the cause of their death. They will be responsible for their deaths, murderers, essentially. Um, and it's totally cool to think there are problems with that. That's one of the reasons why I brought up DROs and arbitration, because in a free society, we're going to need people to be able to come in that we have a shared common set of rules and agreements with and be able to help us parse through these things in the most peaceful and amicable manner that we can, uh, you know, like a real justice system would, right? Um, so I don't know if that like entirely answers your question. I know I kind of went off in a couple different directions there, but these are all really important things since it, it is a hard pill to swallow, but there are solutions to every problem that we have with this. Like, I don't like... The idea of neighbor Tim getting run run over by Jim Bob because Jim Bob couldn't wait three seconds for him to hobble off of his property onto the private road that he has access to or whatever. We can solve that through agreements. Our community can decide you must give trespassers a minimum 10 seconds to leave your property before we can just make that agreement between each other because we consent to that agreement but I cannot impose that agreement on you. I cannot say, Shepard, you must wait 10 seconds for somebody to leave their property, or five, or three, or two, or one. If you're being trespassed against, your self-ownership, property, life, all of it has been violated, and you get to respond to that threat with as much force as you deem necessary. Okay. That's the way I see it. Okay. So maybe, as you have mentioned, anti-subjectivism could be a complete system, or as I have, have argued, it isn't a complete system for life because it doesn't get into work ethic or, you know, that kind of thing. Like there are a lot of parts of life that, that could be added. So, so I'm thinking in the analogy of that we were talking about of the looking under the hood of the car, anti-subjectivism is the car. You look under the hood to get all the details. Well, maybe I am now saying, hey, I got a little baby I want to transport safely. Um, and you're saying, well, that's not part of anti-subjectivism, but you're more than welcome to build a nice car seat and install it in the car. But mm -hmm. that's not your department. Your department is building the, the foundational vehicle and anything we, people want to add, as long as every there's consent, then we can add that. So if I say to my neighbor, hey, man, does it sound good if anybody ever trespasses or if we ever get kidnapped and somebody throws us, how about we give each other a reasonable amount of time? Yeah, that sounds good. Well, hey, how are we going to decide reasonable? Well, why don't we get together six or 12 people that are just kind of normal people, and then we'll have some smart people that try to manipulate them into believing one way or the other, but those smart people <laughs> go into a little room, and then they come back, oh, okay, well, there, that's, that sounds like a good system, and we all agree to it. We sign on the dotted line. And there's nothing wrong with that in anti-subjectivism, but coming up with that as part of the foundation is just, it's beyond the scope. Is that a good way if I could think about it? Yeah. So um, I like the car analogy, like uh, anti-subjectivism is a base model Honda Civic. Uh, it doesn't have cruise control. Um, it gets, it, it, it's reliable. Uh, it does the job. And it doesn't have any frills associated with it whatsoever. But if you've got a kid 
Honda Civics don't come with car seats in them. You're going to need a car seat if you want your kid to be safe. So you put a car seat in. And maybe you think the factory wipers kind of suck. They get the job done. They get the rain off. But you want the ones that really stick. So when you're going like 140 on the highway in the, (laughs) I don't know, crazy rain or whatever, you can, while you're hydroplaning, see where you're (laughs) going, right? Um, Or you want to put a new cool suspension on it or whatever. You get to add all these things on. But let's pretend that um, it's actually 500 people that own the Honda Civic and it's your community's Honda Civic and you all get to agree what what modifications go on. And so then everybody agrees that these are the modifications that go on the Honda Civic. And as long as everybody agrees, because they are all equal owners of this Honda Civic, right? Everybody's, the idea here is that everybody is the, uh, the owner of their own bodies and that the modifications would necessarily be a limitation on their what actions they can do. Um, so as long as everybody agrees, you can put on whatever modifications you want. <laughs> you, okay. you, if you want to make it to, if you want to make it to where uh, you know a bunch of homeless people can sleep in your <laughs> Honda Civic at <laughs> night when you're not using it, or that squatters can come by and claim your Honda Civic after a week of not touching it or whatever. Sure, whatever. But you're not going to find that in the Honda Civic. It comes with a lock for a reason. You have to choose to unlock it. You know? <laughs> okay. So, Christian, another question I had, and it's kind of relating to the 500 people who own this Honda Civic. Um, do they all have to agree to let the homeless guy sleep in it? Whatever. Um, could there be a lot of different uh, DROs or agreements or whatever? And what happens? And and. I don't want to fall into the trap and I I am doing this to you, but I'm basically saying, yeah, but how would you fix the roads? And you're like, Oh, I have no clue about roads, but I think we'll get it done. Like, I don't want to be asking that question. I think it's worth kind of playing around with it a little bit though. And saying, so if my neighbor and I disagree about the, what did you say? The use of force or the, the, the continuum, the uh, proportionality. Yeah. If his DRO and my DRO disagree about the proportionality of force, and then the third neighbor who's watching, uh, do you have any ideas on how that might work? Yeah. So just as a quick comment, um, I think, uh, I I don't want to sound too critical, but I think everybody who says the free market finds a way is both equally correct and equally boring in the way that they give answers. Like, Yeah, okay, the free market will find a way. They will find out ways to build the roads. But what's a lot more interesting is talking about ways that the free market can build the roads, right? So we've got a situation here to where um, a community, a local community, has uh, competing DROs in the same area. Very likely could be a possibility. I wouldn't consider it an ideal one. I would try to, you know, find a DRO that as many people around you could agree with as possible. And I think there's a good chance that kind of like how cable works now, DROs will kind of zone themselves and you can choose whether or not you want to, or maybe you'll have two options of a DRO and kind of just like cable and telecom DROs, I believe in this kind of system, though not necessarily uh, would come to agreements on how they're going to deal with cross cases. So you have uh, two DROs in the same area um, they're using, you know, like like the cable companies, they might be using the same or similar hardware, right? Like the internet has to come from somewhere. Not every cable company has its own line to the internet or or something, you know, or uses their own servers that has their own little internet that they're stored in. These things communicate and they talk and they come to agreements with how they're going to communicate and how they're going to talk. And uh, DROs would do the same kind of thing. So it would be like, hey, maybe it would just go up to a full arbitration. You know, maybe there wouldn't be any set guidelines or rules and it would just be who could make the stronger case and since you've consented already to the engagement of the DROs activities including their agreements with other DROs then if you want to maintain that consensual relationship with the DRO you would say okay we're going to take this to arbitration we're going to make our case and whatever comes up comes up you know and uh, I can choose to to continue to engage with the DRO and respect its decision or not and withdraw and then face whatever repercussions might come from that. Um, That's one solution. That's one way it could go down. And I think generally speaking, um, these are obviously not going to be perfect systems because we're humans and anything that we build is going to have ripples, wrinkles, and flaws. 
um, or th- at least at the minimum things we don't like. Um, there, there very well could be outcomes of this system that people don't like. But overall, I think it would lead to a more peaceful, generally more uh, amicable, polite society where people get outcomes that they feel uh, serve them some kind of justice. Um, so if you, for example, let's not even say it was you, let's go back to your, your third neighbor who shot the first neighbor, and they're in competing DROs, um, well, then the family of the first neighbor or the wife or whoever is also under that DRO could make an arbitration claim against the third neighbor, and then they would go and hash it out between them to figure out if there was like a rights violation or who initiated an aggression, who was justified in doing what. And their determination at the end of that road um, would be something that both parties would have had to agree beforehand as members of a DRO to be cool with. And if they're not cool with that determination, whichever way it swings, then they would just be leaving their uh, DRO contract entirely, and which comes with all sorts of consequences like we talked about earlier. Um, I think it would be very hard to get insurance or to get security if you don't have a DRO uh, <laughs> these things might even be a package deal, you know, and you could be losing on all of that. Um, and then you're kind of like leaving yourselves to the wolves to where somebody else could decide, well, I think neighbor three did, you know, violate this person's rights and they don't have a DRO representing them anymore. Um, like I said, it, it, it is kind of a pot shot what I'm, what I'm projecting out here, but it could be a way that the free market could handle it. And one that I think could yeah. work in a lot of situations. And I think it's good that the your thought and my thought of anti-subjectivism or the non-aggression principle, unlike some theories or ideas, they're not utopian in nature. Like we're not fooling ourselves and yeah. saying everything's going to be perfect on day two. No, there's still humans are going to be humans and there are going to be issues. Um, and I think that my problem with this neighbor scenario is is a feel problem and not a think problem. Like I just don't feel right about your answer, but I can't think, I can't think better about how to do it and and I'm and just pondering now I'm thinking out loud because this is how we do philosophy I guess if you're if you're a lay philosopher like me anyway I'm thinking if my DRO was sophisticated enough that we thought ahead and said hey this is really silly but what if somebody drops onto your flagpole from the building or from the uh, the floor above or what if if you're kidnapped and you're dropped off on somebody's property what if these silly things happen should we have something in place to deal with them and my dro state farm says here it's a good point let's write a few pages on how to deal with that and then all 500 people who own that Toyota Corolla say, okay, this, this, everybody in this group, this club, this DRO agrees that it's, you give people a few minutes to get off your property. And that's just Mm -hmm. the right thing to do. Well, if the neighbor is using the Honda Civic DRO, the the Allstate, and they weren't sophisticated enough to address this potentiality, then I guess this comes This just is going to be one of those imperfect circumstances that human critters are going to find themselves in at some point. Yeah, you. I've always said uh, I had a conversation with somebody the other day regarding uh, some things to do with like children and parenting, and uh, one of the my basically my comment to wrap it all up was like, "Hey, make sure this is not the first time your DRO is thinking about this because this is really complicated stuff, and you're paying them." to uphold what you believe to be the right, fair, and just thing. Um, And if they're not reflecting that, then you're getting a crap service. Uh, (laughs) Now, in the DRO's defense, there are an infinite number of hypotheticals, each with their nuances. But the legal books, or I guess we're past books at this point, the legal folders on their desktops will be large and contain lots of documents. And I'm using legal in the sense of like an agreed law, not like in a a state law or anything like that, just to make sure that that's clear. Yeah. Um, Yeah, there are some interesting things that came up. Back when I was a cop, I had this circumstance that was kind of funny that it's like we couldn't figure out a good solution to it. Larceny is the taking, the illegal, the unlawful, taking, leading away, et cetera, of personal property with the intent to permanently deprive the owner thereof. Well, there was somebody that found out this hotel kept their uh, janitor's closet unlocked 
And once a week, they would go over, grab the vacuum, sneak it out of the back door, go vacuum their house, and then bring it back and drop it off at the hotel. And here I am as a cop thinking, well, that's not permanently depriving the hotel of the vacuum. So is the person guilty of five minutes worth of wear and tear? Or So I think in any system, whether it's a, a state mafia, whatever run system, or if it's more of a, a voluntarist kind of system, there are going to be these weird edge cases that, like you say, you better, you better think of these vacuum and neighbor kidnapped running over people's stuff and come up with as much of it as you can ahead of time. It'll give the attorneys a good job to do. And uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's worth thinking about. There's two uses for hypotheticals. And that's the one I think is not very cool is to try to just stump people and to be like, Hey, uh, I'm going to put, throw a hypothetical at you that you can't answer, you know? Uh, and then the other one is to bring up legitimate concerns that of, of the implications of a system. And I think there there's plenty of reasons to do number two you have to do number two otherwise you're going to miss things you're not going to have answers to problems and uh, you're setting yourself up for failure whether or not everything like you believe in the groundwork is wrong it's really easy if it's the first time you've ever thought about something to be very wrong at whatever conclusion you come to like i'm sure if you know you can watch movies about uh, shooting a gun and i'm sure you've met plenty of people who um you know know very well about uh, or believe that they've seen enough and know enough about shooting a gun and they come up and they just have absolutely no idea they have no clue because they've just like projected this one idea onto how it all all goes down or driving a car first time a kid drives a car They've seen everybody drive a car before. It's like so easy. <laughs> and then they get behind the wheel and they have no idea what they're doing. Uh, and it's a recipe for disaster. So <laughs> it's uh, yep. it's it's that same kind of an idea. It doesn't matter what you're doing. Uh, if you want to make sure that you're doing it right, it better not be your first time. <laughs> yep. And what, isn't there uh, there's something about honing an edge or a fire hones a uh, whatever or tempers the yeah. steel right whatever that saying is like that's why i love conversations like this even the one that i had with patrick a month or two ago in which i just completely like i looked like if you, anybody wants to see me looking like a bigger idiot than i normally do watch that video and wince for me like it was the most embarrassing public <laughs> appearance of my life but i grew from it and i don't have much ego left so it was it's cool like and i'm now i'm a better conversationalist debater I, I prefer conversation or or uh, thinking partner or whatever. I, now I'm better at it. And yeah, you, sometimes you put yourself in those uncomfortable circumstances and you do it over and over and try to improve yourself. And then you don't make a fool out of yourself talking about your 357 Magnum Glock shotgun. Um, so, yeah, you be a little bit prepared for it. 357 um, Magnum Glock shotgun. I'm saying yeah. that one. <laughs> Fully semi-automatic, by the way. Uh, <laughs> 30 round clipazine. Yep, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so well, let me ask you a question, Shepard. Have I said anything today that uh, it, it, I don't have to, you know, I'm not saying 100% of the way there, but if any of the things I've said today about like why um, – we might hold these negative reactions to some unfortunate implications of anti-subjectivism and how we ought to kind of like situate our attitudes about them. Has any of that resonated with you? Please that, say that. I'm not understanding what you mean by that. Yeah. So basically the idea of like, Hey, um, there's going to be implications that we don't like. Uh, okay. And we just have to figure out how we're going to situate ourselves, uh, our attitudes towards those outcomes and kind of maybe not even make peace with them, but understand why they are the way they are. Have I made any headway on that? Yes, upfront? you've made headway. And and yet I, I, I still it doesn't sit right with me. And I've had mm -hmm. such good success in my life when things don't sit right with me and I look at them more deeply. I come to. Uh, I'm able to figure out, oh yeah, that's why it's not sitting right with me. And maybe this is one of those things like seeing the video of the guy kicking the dog in the elevator, just kicking this poor puppy over and over. It doesn't sit right with me, but that happened 10, 15, 20 years ago. The dog's dead. I don't know who the guy is. I'm not going to figure it out. Some stuff sucks and move forward 
dot org. Like I, I, I don't, <laughs> I, I, I don't know what I, I really hope, and I'm guessing I'm going to put some words in your mouth. Christian and I both really hope that someone who's watching this right now has the aha moment and can using proper the framework for argumentation, logic, reason, evidence, um, the the basic rules of philosophy can come up and say, no, Shepard, Christian is absolutely right, and this is why. Or, or no, yeah. <laughs> no, Christian, Shepard is absolutely right, and this is why. Because I'm not able to, to, to rationally, mechanically explain why my gut feeling is at odds with what Christian is saying. So help a brother out and, uh, you know, c- please make the comments. If you're not comfortable challenging Patrick or Christian to a video thing, uh, write something out. If you're not comfortable with that, write something to me, and then I will try to present that case. Um, like, I think we both want input to hone this even more. Yeah, it's like going way back towards the beginning of the conversation, um, you know, trend line towards freedom. Well, the whole point of philosophy is that trend line towards truth. Um, I'm not going to be, I refuse there's a possible world where it's true, but I refuse to believe that I am completely right on 100% of this. Um, but I haven't seen anything better to, to give me a reason to think otherwise. Not saying there isn't. I want to make that sure that's very clear. Um, but if I think it's, I think it would be very strange if in a thousand years from now, people are still talking about anti-subjectivism in the exact same way that I'm talking about it today. Uh, that, that to me just doesn't match with the history of, of intellectual thought as we've, we've come to know it. Uh, but that, uh, we have to pick our positions that we believe are justifiable and correct and champion them because that's how we're going to find people who disagree with us and find people that trend line towards truth, getting closer, getting closer. If I never staked a commitment in my entire life, I would have probably learned nothing because the places where you learn the most or where you say, I believe in this. And someone's like, well, that's wrong because of this. And you go, well, wow, because you not only get to take away the fact that there's a new cooler, more interesting, more correct idea. You get to understand why your previous idea was wrong. And that will set you up for continued success on that trend line towards truth. It's really easy to just take something that you believe is true and just like put it in the back of your head and never fight for it or whatever and just kind of, but if you want to engage in that trend line towards truth, you have to be willing to plant your flag somewhere. (laughs) I like that. I like that. That's the, uh, what in law school, that's the, is that the, uh, not, I forget what it's called, Um, but there's the process where you have to argue your point really hot and heavy the, the professor's constantly calling you why well why no <laughs> why and you have to do yeah and you're stumbling and you fight through it and then you actually know it by the time you're done with it so yeah that, that's that's cool um what haven't we talked about today that we should have what have we oh, missed boring lectures on the deep mechanics of why anti-subjectivism is cool if you're a nerd like me um maybe that's worth saying again uh you know it, it's i think um it's a dime a dozen for people to get up in front of a camera and be like i have this cool idea let me tell you about all, all of its implications and explain like none of the mechanics to you and the only reason that i'm not doing that to such a great extent right now is because we've already done it and i know it's a lot to ask of people to say like hey go read this document but if you really 100% seriously want some like real meat to the claims that uh, that I've made here, you know, antisubjectivism.com. We got the manifesto on the disenthrall page as well, both the YouTube and the Odyssey for audiobook listening, if you're into that. Uh, and it's all there. And um, some of the language might be hard, difficult to parse if you're new to it. But I think most people, if you go in with an open mind and just kind of listen to what's being said, um, can walk away with it a, a very good understanding. Uh, even if you don't have 110% of it, and then we can talk about it some. You can come up and come up into the Disenthrall Discord and be like, Christian, what do you mean by this thing? I don't know what that is, or I think you're wrong on this. I would love that. It would be, it would make my night if you did that. <laughs> Wonderful. So that's that's an important thing too. Um, 
don't um i always am telling people to be very skeptical of when people are making claims about having having the answer because well let's face it there's a lot of people who i think are wrong that you should be skeptical <laughs> about like there's no other way to, to to square that circle it's that's the truth of it um uh, so be skeptical of me too. I'm not a special case scenario. I'm not an exception to that rule. If you don't like something that I said, or you don't think it's right, you know, do the homework, show me where I'm wrong. I'm, I'm, I'm right here for the whole journey. That's how I got here. So who, who am I to tell somebody that they can't do that? You know? <laughs> okay, great. Well, thank you for being on Christian. And, uh, what, what is your, you have a, uh, a YouTube Odyssey channel as well. What is the name of that? And, uh, how do we find Yes. It? I'm actually a co-host on Disenthrall now. Um, so I used to have an older YouTube channel. That's old news. That's the old Christian. That's the pre-anti-subjectivism Christian. He's no more. Um, <laughs> so I am co-hosting a Disenthrall with Patrick Smith. Um, I'm doing some some of my own videos that I'm hosting on there, and we're still doing collaborative content together. Uh, we've got some spicy videos coming up on Hans Herbin Hoppe. If any of you guys like or dislike him, it could be very interesting. <laughs> um, and not spicy as in like we're doing a takedown. We've had plenty of people ask us to do a dive, a deep dive into his ideas. And so that's what we're going to do. But it's Hoppa. It can't not get spicy. It's Hoppa. <laughs> Great. So, uh, that's something to look forward to. Uh, and yeah, I, I think that's the most important thing. Go check out Disenthrall. Subscribe. Uh, if, if some, if any of you guys aren't familiar with, uh, the body of work that Patrick's done, um, super, super smart dude, whole reason I'm sitting in this chair today. Um, God knows where I would be <laughs> otherwise <laughs> if I didn't find his work. So I owe him that much. Um, so it would be cool if, uh, you guys would go and subscribe to his channel. Great. Well, thank you for being on Christian and, uh, uh let's, let's find some more stuff to argue about and talk again. Oh, of course. Any day. Take care.